to another edition of the Scholarship Highlight, brought to you by the Duke Center for Firearms Law. My name is Daryl Miller. I'm the Melvin G. Shem Professor of Law at Duke Law School. I'm also the co-faculty director of the Duke Center for Firearms Law. And here at the Scholarship Highlight, we talk to young uh, and sometimes not so young professors who are writing really interesting and innovative scholarship uh, on firearms law in an effort to develop firearms law and Second Amendment law as a field. And I am just absolutely delighted to have uh, Sean Fields here. Uh, Sean is the assistant professor at Campbell Law School down in Raleigh, North Carolina. And he is going to talk to us about this fascinating and really interesting new article uh, called Second Amendment Sanctuaries that's forthcoming in the Northwestern uh, University Law Review. Welcome, Sean. Great, thank you so much for having me, Daryl. I'm thrilled to be here. So happy to have you here uh, and close by. Um, so we'll uh, just j jump right into it. Um, sure. uh, this is a really interesting and provocative uh, new article um, and very timely as well. Why don't you give us whatever your sort of elevator speech on the, on the, uh, on the piece is uh, and then we'll go from there. Sure, that sounds good. So if I take the narrow lens on my elevator speech, the focus of the article is right there in the title. It's about Second Amendment sanctuaries. It's about this new phenomenon that we've seen within the last year or so of local jurisdictions raising resistance to any enacted or even proposed gun control regulations at the state level. And within that narrow lens, really what the article is trying to do is respond to some early and consistent commentary that said these Second Amendment sanctuary movements don't stand a chance in terms of legal viability. Uh, they're preempted by uh, proposed state enactments. Um, they don't have any constitutional legs to stand on. There is no localized right to resist a duly enacted state law, at least in places like Virginia that operate under the Dillon's rule, which allows uh, state governments to commandeer and, and essentially force local governments to do whatever they want. So that's sort of the narrow lens responding to and trying to find some limited viability for the Second Amendment sanctuary movements. I like to take the broader lens on this, though, and see this particular Second Amendment sanctuary movement as symptomatic of a larger issue, a larger tug of war that we've seen intrastate between state governments and local governments. And what I really want to do in the piece is provide some limited pathway for local governments to have greater space to either affirmatively run their own jurisdictions without state interference, or in the case of Second Amendment sanctuaries, passively resist. So really, while the article is called Second Amendment sanctuaries, I don't view this as much of a Second Amendment piece or even a firearms piece. I see the, the current movement as a vehicle to start a broader discussion about localism and whether we want to have a more robust form of home rule for local jurisdictions, or as I discussed later on in the piece, and I'm sure we'll talk, we'll talk about, sort of a novel idea of sub-federal anti-commandeering, a sort of analog to what we see under traditional 10th Amendment principles, where state and local governments can resist commandeering effects of the federal government. I explore whether there's room, either as a matter of policy or as a matter of law, for local jurisdictions to have the same sort of structural resistance to state enactments. Um, so you're obviously touching uh, in this piece on a lot of uh, really um, uh, contemporary issues um, and a lot of issues. And from your, you know, your your remarks just now, I understand this is kind of part of a larger project to talk about localism and sub-federal um, uh, allocation of institutional power and so forth. So um, how did you get into, what, what brought you to sort of uh, use this particular vector to talk about those issues? What, why did you choose, you know, to write this piece at this time on, uh, on these issues? It's an interesting question. Every time I've talked about this article, I've been asked this question, and I think it's because the Second Amendment sanctuary movement just didn't exist a year ago. This certainly wasn't part of a five-year-long uh, research agenda that I had to talk about Second Amendment sanctuaries because they didn't exist five years ago. Um, and, and the interesting thing about how I came to write this particular article is I think it was really the right place at the right time. Um, I don't style myself as a Second Amendment scholar per se. I've written several articles about firearms as they relate to the Fourth Amendment, uh, particularly with respect to how the calculus for reasonable suspicion is changing. Um, when we have uh, greater uh, 
greater room for individuals to lawfully carry firearms in public. I teach criminal procedure at Campbell. I also was in the middle of working on a project about uh, immigration localism and subfederal commandeering in that space because I teach immigration law at Campbell. Um, and really, while I was working on those two lines of research, we saw the Second Amendment sanctuary movement bubble up. And one of the reasons why I was personally involved is I'm from southwestern Virginia, where a lot of, where in many ways it was ground zero for this particular movement. So I just happened to be, I think, in the right place in my research and had the right passion and the right interest for these issues as they relate to firearms, as they relate to subfederal commandeering, as they relate to localism. Um, and I have a larger research project uh, where I'm going to be exploring localism in, in more in greater depth. Um, and it just happened to be that I was at the right place, I think, to discuss this particular moment. I, I think one of the reasons why this particular political movement is so ripe for uh, discussion as a vehicle for a broader localism movement is precisely because of the ways it contrasts with immigrant sanctuaries. Immigrant sanctuaries have a built-in structural uh, component to it. And we've seen with the litigation um, for the last 35 years for the existence of immigrant sanctuaries, a 10th Amendment structural challenge to the federal government's ability to commandeer and force state and local governments to enact their provisions to enforce their own immigration laws. This provides linguistically the same sort of approach because the word sanctuary is being co-opted and affirmatively co-opted in this sense by, by groups on the right largely. Um, but it provides a great opportunity for us to discuss whether that same type of structural component can be raised to resist state power at the subfederal level and whether it can be used to resist power from a superior government entity, not as a matter of structural integrity, but as a matter of substantive, substantive constitutional right. That's, that's really interesting in terms of um, talking through, I think it sort of anticipates uh, some of the questions that we, uh, you know, it, that this uh, on this program have, which is, I mean, you are uh, talking about uh, sanctuary in uh, respect with respect to firearms. Um, uh, sanctuaries are also known with respect to immigration, and so um, you know the political polarities of these tend to be different, right? If you're talking about immigration sanctuaries, we're usually talking about, you know, uh, blue localities vis-a-vis uh, -vis sort of red states, um, and that uh, polarity is flipped when we're talking about, for example, Virginia and the state wanting to have uh, more robust uh, gun safety legislation and, and uh, resistance by the counties and, and some uh, sub-state uh, sub uh, government entities. Um, but I guess, you know, one question that comes from that is, uh, you know, other than the uh, political polarity. What are the what are the similarities and differences? You sort of talked about it a little bit, which is the Tenth Amendment. There's not a Tenth Amendment analog in uh, uh, state local uh, jurisdiction, except to the degree we're talking about home rule. Um, but what are the what are the features that you would say are the same, or what are the features that you would say are are different when we think about the phenomenon of sanctuaries when we're talking about um, guns? or second, the Second Amendment versus immigration? Sure, I, I think that's a good question. It, it, you know, I, I wanna say at the outset, there is no special talismanic quality or, or legal significance to the word sanctuary itself. Indeed, the word itself is difficult to define. Um, one, one of our friends in, in the localism space, uh, Deep Gulusi Karam at Santa Clara has done a good job in several articles uh, describing, you know, how this word sanctuary has has taken on a quality that really you know has no legal significance to it and in fact you know the the very first second amendment sanctuary jurisdiction uh in illinois was championed by a county commissioner who said affirmatively i want to co-op uh, I, I want to co-op what the liberals are doing in the immigration sanctuary space if they can if they can do it if they can ignore the law then i can do it too to protect my second amendment rights with that said, and I do, I do want to uh, circle back to your, to your introductory remarks about the partisanship piece about this, but to answer the question directly, that there's, there's some similarities with Second Amendment sanctuaries and immigration sanctuaries and some differences. The similarities as I see them really have to do with what we mean by this term sanctuary to begin with and, and what they broadly are communicating, whether they have legal effect or not, they have a real expressive communicative aspect to them as a matter of, uh, of sort of political communication to constituents. 
is we, a, a sanctuary movement, be it immigration sanctuary, a Second Amendment sanctuary, seeks to resist the enactment of a superior body, a superior governmental body's uh, enforcement of a particular law. In the immigration sanctuary context, the federal government has expressed certain policies with respect to enforcement, particularly with respect to the way that immigration and customs enforcement is used to enforce immigration law on the ground in local jurisdictions, and state and local governments that are immigrant sanctuaries seek to express either symbolically or more than symbolically resistance to that particular policy. The same thing is true with Second Amendment sanctuaries. Washington County, Virginia, or you know, Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, May wish, to, may wish to symbolically express through a Second Amendment sanctuary resolution, we as a jurisdiction do not agree with the proposed or the enacted law at the superior governmental body, in this case at the, at the state level, be it Virginia or New Mexico or Colorado or Illinois passing an extreme risk protection order law or proposing an assault weapons ban, which we haven't seen enacted yet in any state. These Second Amendment sanctuaries, like immigrant sanctuaries, are expressing as a form of political communication, we do not like these, these laws. We don't think that they fit with our ethos. Uh, mm -hmm. in, you know, in San Francisco, where the immigrant sanctuary movement was born, there was a very, a, a very explicit desire to communicate, San Francisco welcomes immigrants even if the federal government does not. What we see in places like Buchanan County, Virginia, that local jurisdiction is saying we have a rural hunting recreational gun culture and we welcome the introduction of firearms. We welcome strong Second Amendment rights in a way that maybe Richmond or Northern Virginia does not. Now it goes beyond that expressive communication when, when immigrant sanctuaries and Second Amendment sanctuaries erect affirmative roadblocks to resistance. And that's where I think we see some of the differences. The, one of the main differences, as you mentioned, uh, is, is structural. Immigrant sanctuaries have won uh, several court battles by resisting the federal government's uh, the federal government's desire to commandeer local police agencies to to work with ICE to enforce federal immigration law. The Tenth Amendment does not allow the federal government to force state and local officials to enforce federal law. And we know in the immigration context, the Supreme Court has held repeatedly that the federal government has preempted in the field of immigration law and has the sole enforcement capabilities there. So that's one significant difference, the structural guarantee under the, the federal constitution under the 10th Amendment. There is no analog to that in the state space. Traditionally, states have been seen as sovereign and states have been seen as uh, command, being able to command and dictate the role of local governments, even in places that have a form of what we call home rule in the localism space, where state constitutions may carve out some narrow autonomous rule for local jurisdictions, those home rule guarantees have been interpreted narrowly. And in the vast majority of the states where we see the Second Amendment sanctuary booming, those aren't even home rule states. Those are what we call Dillon's rule states where the state government can control the local government in any way and the local government is just seen as a subsidiary of a stronger state government. So that's, that's really the primary difference as a matter of, of structural law uh, between the immigrant sanctuaries and the Second Amendment sanctuaries. One, one other legal difference I'd like to, to point out, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit more, is the immigrant sanctuary legal movement, the legal viability, rests primarily on these structural autonomous power guarantees. There's very little in, in way of substantive constitutional litigation in this space. In other words, local jurisdictions that, that style themselves as immigrant sanctuaries aren't making arguments in court that what the federal government is doing as a matter of immigration law and policy is unconstitutional or otherwise unlawful. They just don't want to be forced to enforce it. The difference in the Second Amendment sanctuary context is baked right into these resolutions themselves. These resolutions, by and large, say we refuse to enforce laws that violate the Second Amendment, which begs the question, are they saying that they'll only refuse to enforce laws that violate the Second Amendment? leaving it up to the states and for the courts to decide whether a red flag law, for, existent, for, for instance, does that, or are they affirmatively stating these laws as proposed or enacted by the state government to regulate firearm sales and firearm possession do in fact violate the Second Amendment, and for that substantive reason, we refuse to enforce those laws.
So, I mean, that obviously leads to a couple of follow-on questions, really interesting ones. You've got this idea, I think it's really uh, interesting in your paper, uh, where you're really talking about Second Amendment sanctuaries as not claiming structural rights in the sort of Tenth Amendment context per se, but they're actually like leveraging what we do usually think of as individual rights to structural ends. And you have got this quote in here, uh, a limited form of sub-federal anti-commandeering analogous to federal anti-commandeering may be appropriate at least when a genuine constitutional claim exists and the local ordinance places no affirmative roadblocks in the way of state officers enforcing state law. Now, can you sort of unpack that a little bit? Because uh, I mean, this is a uh, this is a really interesting move. Uh, we usually think about you know in the constitutional law space uh, structure and rights as being two separate areas. I mean, they're sometimes taught in two totally separate courses in uh, the curriculum. But what you're saying here is that local communities are leveraging individual rights to structural ends as a way of making this sub-federal anti-commandeering argument. And I just want you to sort of help us understand what the, how to understand that move. Sure. I, I think one way to look at how I'm leveraging these substantive constitutional rights to, to couch uh, a sub-federal anti-commandeering space is it, it acts as a form of a limiting principle in this sense. Um, our, our friend Richard Rifle at Columbia uh, made a, a very astute observation in response to, to this claim that I make that 90% of what a state government does is commandeer the locality. You know, mm -hmm. a, a, a sheriff or a prosecutor may not feel commandeered when they're enforcing state criminal law, but in a very real sense, that's what they're doing. The state has passed a statewide criminal enactment and the local government is, is involved in enforcing it. So I don't want this idea of sub-federal anti-commandeering to swallow the entire functioning of, of state governments or the interplay between state and local governments. I, th I think one real risk with, hat, with articulating a sub-federal anti-commandeering principle is allowing local governments to just claim or to affirmatively ignore any statewide enactment they don't like. So in, in, a, in a practical sense, the substantive constitutional uh, requirement for uh, local government resistance to state law acts as a limiting principle. But on a more normative level, I see some analogs to this um, in cases like Brummer versus Evans coming out of Colorado, where a local government passed an anti-discrimination ordinance protecting LGBTQ rights and the state of Colorado attempted to preempt it. Well, the local government asserted a substantive constitutional right on behalf of its constituents in that locality under the 14th Amendment's due process clause under equal protection which the Supreme Court declined to take up at that time. Um, acting as, an, acting as uh, a local government constituency um, articulating associational standing to assert substantive constitutional rights on behalf of its local citizens. And, and if there are genuine substantive constitutional claims to be made, I think there's space for locality, be it a, a, an individual citizen or the local government itself, subject to standing concerns, to say these state enactments that you're forcing us to, to uh, enforce in our local jurisdiction simply violate the law. They simply are unconstitutional. Now. There's some caveats to that. One is that the indiv an individual citizen could just sue, or an individual group could just sue. And, and that's one thing that certainly could be done here. And, and I think it's something worth noting for those who aren't as well versed in the, the sort of the Second Amendment sanctuary movement. Most of these resolutions have been passed in response to proposals, not actually enacted state, state laws yet. So there's not... The, there's not even a case that's ripe for adjudication in, in most of these jurisdictions yet. This is really just a sort of staking political ground for uh, in advance of inevitable uh, litigation to come. Um, but an individual could just sue. But that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be room for local government to act as, uh, to act in the place of its constituents and assert associational standing. That's difficult to do in a lot of jurisdictions. Again, I look to San Francisco and Santa Clara counties as places that have styled themselves at, where the city's attorney's office act as a civil rights arm to protect its local citizens. And the sub-federal anti-commandeering principle tries to leverage that without upsetting the entire apple cart and saying that local jurisdictions 
can ignore whatever criminal laws they want to ignore. They could ignore whatever regulations they want to ignore. If there is a strong constitutional claim to be made that, say, for example, a state government passes a criminal, a criminal ordinance outlawing vagrancy, well, we know that that's, uh, that's, that's dead on arrival under constitutional law. So a local government could affirmatively sue on behalf of its constituents or passively resist enforcement of that under this anti-commandeering principle. The same thing would be true in the gun control context. We now know, for, for at least for the last 12 years, we've known that if a city decided to enforce, decided to pass and enforce a, or if a, I'm sorry, if a state decided to pass a statewide absolute handgun ban, well, that would be dead on arrival when it, when it went to court. And so a local jurisdiction could try to assert associational standing on behalf of its citizens, or it could passively, it could passively resist enforcement of that as a violation of the Second Amendment. So one of the interesting things about that uh, is you seem to be suggesting that um, there is some limited authority for local government and local government officials to make some kind of constitutional um, assessments independent of what the judiciary has done. I think you refer to it in your piece uh, as uh, what you, you call it first impression departmentalism, I think is the term that you use. Uh, first impression departmentalism, I'm assuming, means that if the law is unclear, there is some space for local government and local government officials to make sort of constitutional determinations and to act on them in their official capacities. Now, one of the interesting things about that is, uh, of course, about departmentalism is, well, what happens when, in fact, the Supreme Court ends up ruling definitively on the issue? So how would you think through that phenomenon? That is, you have a Second Amendment sanctuary, a leader, a sheriff, a, a, a you know, county commission that makes a determination uh, you know, about the unconstitutionality of a particular regulation. And then, lo and behold, the Supreme Court of the United States upholds the constitutionality of a particular regulation. What is the role of the local government uh, after the Supreme Court has made that determination as opposed to before? I, I, I think at that point, the role of a local constitutional officer to interpret the Constitution ends. Uh, part of what I part of what I like about this concept of first impression departmentalism is I'm not a departmentalist writ large. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm I'm quite sympathetic to the the social coordinating and the settlement functions of the judicial supremacy model. When the Supreme Court uh, acts affirmatively to settle a, a, a constitutional dispute, it coordinates the the functions of the various governmental agencies, be it at the state, local, or federal level, and provides some sort of settlement and some sort of predictability that we want in our laws and that we want in our policy and in our actors. But as as you you know better than I do, how unsettled Second Amendment jurisprudence continues to be. I mean, we since Heller, we've seen a certain amount of settling at the lower courts, but the Supreme Court continues to punt on. The opportunity to to take up some of these questions and settle some of these uh, thornier issues with respect to the Second Amendment, with respect to the substantive contours here. So when we have state enactments, be it in the Second Amendment space or a different space, where we don't have a settled Supreme Court precedent or some other settled precedent to 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 provide that judicial supremacy coordination and settlement function, I like the idea of a first impression departmentalist saying. I am an executive officer. I am a legislative officer. I also have a co-equal role in upholding the Constitution and upholding the the sanctity of of laws that are duly enacted. And I am bound not to enforce or pass laws that violate the Constitution. If I don't know, if I've not been commanded by the Supreme Court that a certain provision violates the Constitution then I think a local government official, a local enforcement officer, has a role to play in deciding that. I think take, taking, for example, these extreme risk protection order laws that, that allow for courts to issue a form of protection order um, for someone who poses an extreme risk to themselves or others. They're sometimes pejoratively referred to as red flag laws. Uh, one of the, you know, we, we've seen very little litigation that's decided this one way or the other. We've seen a couple of cases in Indiana and a couple of cases in Connecticut, but we certainly haven't seen anything approaching um, 
a Supreme Court precedent determining whether whether and to what extent these laws violate the Second Amendment or the, the due process clause under the 14th Amendment. We did recently see a, a case in the Fifth Circuit that started to suggest that there might be some constitutional problems on an, ad, on an as-applied basis. That's a perfect example of where we don't have any sort of settlement and coordinating function. And so if there's a plausible argument to be made that a particular state's extreme risk protection order violates the Second Amendment or violates somebody's 14th Amendment due process rights, a local prosecutor I believe has not only the right but the duty not to enforce that law. There's an incredible amount of discretion for county commissioners, for police officers, for prosecutors to enforce to enforce uh, a state's given criminal laws or other types of laws. We see that in in how different priorities are set even for just local police departments. They decide to exercise their discretion as one of really the only types of local autonomous power they have to set their own agenda for what types of laws they're going to enforce. That has nothing to do with departmentalism or unsettled constitutional law. If anything, I think there's a stronger argument to be made for these local officials to passively resist a law in, in the exercise of their enforcement discretion when they genuinely believe there's an articulable basis that it could violate the Constitution. Well, uh, I mean, that's, that's a, it's a great, uh, a great problem, you know, to sort of explore. Um, I'm really glad that you're writing this piece. Um, you know, in the last few seconds that we, we have uh, of our time together, um, you know, is there anything that you want to sort of say either about the um, uh, current application of uh, your theories to things like, um, uh, you know, the closure of, uh, of um, uh, ranges and other things due to COVID, um, or more generally, you know, um, who are you hoping to uh, pick this up and, and and read it and start to think about it? Other than you know, uh, us here at the at the at the Center for Firearms Law. <laughs> so I, I I think the I think the current pandemic has complicated everything. Um, mm -hmm. It's complicated every aspect of our lives, and and, and I tend to side with the group that find strong constitutional authority for states to enact their police powers to, to act on the welfare of citizens and the federal government's role in doing so as well, um, irrespective of what we might think constitutionally about a state closing firearms retailers in a vacuum. Um, the, whether we're talking about a firearms retailer, whether we're talking about a shooting range, or whether we're talking about a place to get a haircut, which I desperately need, I neither have a constitutional right to get a haircut, nor do I believe I have a constitutional right to force firearms retailers to remain open when we're in the risk of a, of a contagious pandemic like this. Um, so I, that's, that's sort of, you know, very succinctly where I tend to, to fall um, in that debate to the extent that there's a debate going on right now. With respect to this, the second part of your question, who do I want to engage here? You know, that's something that I've been puzzling through because I think when you see the title of this article and you start reading through it, a natural landing spot for it is a place like the Duke Center for Firearms Law. And I certainly do want to engage with the firearms policy community, but I think you agree with me that this article really isn't about Second Amendment jurisprudence. In fact, towards the end of the article, I kind of punt on that and say, I'm not here to settle one way or the other whether these proposed statewide enactments for gun control violate the Second Amendment or not. I'm here really talking about how this is a vehicle for broader discussion about localism. And so I'm glad that um, certain localism scholars are picking this up and responding to it. Um, I'd like to start a discussion. I'd like to continue the discussion that we see with localism scholars about whether we want, as a matter of, of normative policy, a broader space for home rule. But I also am hoping to introduce this idea of an analogous passive resistance subfederal anti-commandeering a role, a structural role to play at the localism level. And the last, the last group of scholars that I'd really like to, to engage with, when I engage with firearms scholars, I, I tend to see um, individuals who either come at me from a strong gun rights perspective, either as a matter of personal preference or as a matter of constitutional interpretation, or gun control scholars. And I, I don't think this piece really should be should be viewed as favoring one group or the other. What I'm really looking at here is how uh, 
uh, a normative role for a stronger, more robust type of localism can both help rural counties that want to protect their gun, their, their, their gun culture and want to protect sort of their, their recreational habits and maybe even more, um, more need and desire for firearms in places where law enforcement is more diffuse. And also, this type of sub-federal anti-commandeering principle can be utilized in a principled way for more densely populated jurisdictions that want to enact their own more stringent gun control regulations again, subject to the limitations of the Second Amendment. But I, what, what I've seen early on in having discussions with firearms scholars with this piece is a tendency to view this piece as, as protective of gun rights. And, and I, I, I respectfully kind of disagree with that. I think this is more about uh, localism, a, a, a more it certainly favors stronger localism and the Second Amendment sanctuary movement is a vehicle for that, but it could just as easily be utilized um, in spaces like Philadelphia, like Newark, New Jersey, and like Chicago. And so I hope that discussion um, gains more traction in the months as we move forward as well. Well, like I said, Sean, it's a really fabulous article. Uh, really Thank excited you. to see it in print. It's up on uh, at on SSRN, if, uh, if I remember correctly. That's right. Uh, and it's forthcoming in the uh, Northwestern University uh, Law Review. Uh, Sean, thanks so much for sharing your scholarship and um, uh, talking with us today. Thank you, Daryl. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you uh, for tuning in uh, to this scholarship highlight, again, brought to you by the Center for Firearms Law. Uh, you can send your questions or comments to firearms at law.duke.edu. You can check us out at uh, law.duke.edu forward slash firearms. Or you can follow us on Twitter at Duke Firearms Law or subscribe to our blog, Second Thoughts. Thank you. Be well. Be safe. Sean, thank you. Be safe. Thank you, Daryl. And we'll see you next time.